Hello one and all, welcome to Seeing Through Glass. Welcome to a beautiful morning in France. I've just left Paris, where over the last few days I was attending an amazing event with Tag Heuer, who just launched a new watch they've done in collaboration with Porsche, celebrating 50 years of the amazing Carrera RS 2.7. The event was awesome, I had a complete blast. It was kind of cool that they were celebrating 50 years of the RS, whilst I've been celebrating 20 years of this my Ferrari 360 uh, and right now I'm kind of finishing up my final adventure with this car for its big celebratory birthday year. Just done 1500, 2000 miles down to Monaco, across to Maranello in Italy, the home of Ferrari, up to Paris and now I'm slowly making my way towards the Eurotunnel to head home. And whilst this is the kind of final adventure of this big celebratory year, it's not my final ever adventure with this car, I've said many times before, I want to keep this thing forever, if I can. And actually, that's what today's video is about, the if part. I mean, firstly, financially, I have no idea what the future holds, so I can't say I'll never sell this car. One day, I might need to. But more importantly, we have to question how realistic is it going to be for me to own and drive this car in the future? Because, rightfully so, the world is trying to reduce global emissions and many governments around the world are trying to do that by pushing us all to buy electric vehicles. In many countries they're banning the sale of new combustion engine cars from 2030, 2035, 2040. So it's not impossible to imagine that soon after that they might start restricting, trying to ban older combustion engine cars, especially those with higher emissions like naturally aspirated V8 Ferraris. And then finally, we've got to wonder how much longer fuels for cars like this will be readily available and affordable. Right now, fuel prices are higher than they've ever been. And maybe that will continue. If I want to keep this thing forever and continue to enjoy it out on the roads, we need to find another solution. And actually, I think I might have found one. And it's one that doesn't just apply to enthusiasts like me, it's one that I think could be the ultimate solution for the world right now. And as you would have worked out from the title, it's synthetic fuels. So I'm on my way to Belgium to meet up with a company who are doing amazing work in this space and kind of put my money where my mouth is by filling up this car with synthetic fuel, essentially making it carbon neutral straight away and proving to myself and hopefully showing to some of you that there is an option out there to keep these more affordable cars made for enthusiasts or just people out there who can't afford to switch to an EV a way to help reduce global emissions and not feel so guilty when we jump into our cars. Anyway, there's a lot to talk about today so for now I'm going to keep my head down, crack on, make my way to Belgium. I know I just said something about affordable cars whilst sitting in a Ferrari, but I was trying to reference the fact that in general, combustion engine cars are cheaper than electric vehicles. I mean, for example, in the UK, you can go buy a used Volvo for 5,000 pounds, put another 100,000 miles on the clock, not even have to spend that much on maintenance. Whilst if you wanted a practical, usable family electric car, in the UK, you're gonna spend 35 grand at minimum, at minimum. It's quite a huge gap. In addition to that, there have been a whole load of studies that have said for the first 100,000 kilometers, that new electric vehicle will actually emit more carbon than a combustion engine equivalent. So there are quite a few reasons as to why it would probably be a good thing to try and keep existing combustion engine cars on the road if we can reduce or negate their emissions. Anyway, enough waffle. I have come here to historic competition services, which I'm going to show you more of very shortly, to meet up with P1 Performance Fuels. Now, you may have heard that name before, especially if you're a Formula One fan. Some of you might remember that earlier this year, Sebastian Vettel did some demonstration laps at Silverstone in a 1990s Nigel Mansell Williams F1 car. Well, he did that using the P1's Performance Fuels synthetic fuel. It was a carbon neutral drive. 
So if these guys are putting the fuel in an old Formula One car for Sebastian Vettel, I trust them to put it in my 360. So yes, we're going to head inside, find Benjamin from P1 Performance Fuels and ask him what synthetic fuels are all about. This is so formal. <laughs> I, don't, I don't usually do like formal things like this, but I feel like this deserves a formal setting like yeah, this. Yeah, and the setting is, I mean, come on. Outrageous. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone meet. We can't decide whether we're going to call you Ben or Benjamin. We've just been having this, cam this discussion off camera. I kind of want to go Benjamin. Okay. So I'd say we're in a formal like sit down okay, interview okay, setting. Okay, so, then Benjamin. Uh, we've been chatting for a while, right, about this, because I have been so excited by the idea of synthetic fuels for ages. And when you first got in touch and told me about everything, and of course I saw the Sebastian Vettel demo, I was like, I mean, yes, I'm so keen. <laughs> so I guess the best way to start this off is, let's ask the simple question, what is a synthetic fuel? Yes, well, a synthetic fuel is a fuel made out of non-fossil components. So it can be an e-fuel made out of carbon that you capture from the air, water that you do the electrolysis with uh, to have hydrogen, you synthesize that to a fuel, or you take a biomass as a feedstock, a biomass from a second generation ethanol, so a food waste, okay. um, or waste from food production, and you um, put that again with um, hydrogen and make fuel out of it. And our fuels are a combination of the two. Okay, so the food waste can be things like old crops yeah. or like yeah. stuff that's thrown out of McDonald's or not quite? Not that, okay. um, but for example, um, if you produce paper, you have the viscosa that is left and this can also be synthesized to uh, a feedstock um, as a biomass to, to produce the fuel. Okay, amazing. So you, you do both the, the E and the biomass. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> lost it. Combine them, that's what creates your synthetic yeah. fuel. Yeah. And the fuel is exactly the same as fuel that you get at the pump in terms of its properties, capabilities? What would you say? Yes, exactly. So um, our fuel, the fuel that you will use later, um, is the um, EN228 normation, which is exactly the same as the fossil fuel you use at the pump station. So we can just replace that by tomorrow. Okay, so th that's amazing. Uh, and you're already, I mean, you're much further along in sort of producing this and working in this space than maybe people realize. So in terms of motorsport, just shout out some of your creds of places that you're already, your fuel's already being used. Yeah, we are more than happy to be the supplier of the fuel for the World Rally Championship, for the WTCR, ERX, and so on. So we used basically the motorsports as a platform to develop our fuels, to test our fuels. The World Rally Championship is holding in the north of Scandinavia and the south of the desert of Kenya. So that's the right aim to test the fuel. And if you want to have something in, in, in the future mobility, you have to go through motorsport to develop it. Now, as much as I'd love this to be, this is not a paid collaboration. So I'm going to try and ask you the tough questions, I suppose. You mentioned uh, electrolysis is involved in the, the e-fuels part yeah. of it. So do you also require green electricity just like electric vehicles do to be yes. completely carbon neutral? Yes. So um, first of all, we are carbon neutral because we take the carbon out of the air or from feedstock. Okay. We, of course, we burn the fuel in the engine and it pollutes again carbon, but no new carbon. We only took the okay. carbon uh, uh, and use the carbon that we took before. So if everyone started using your fuel or just generic synthetic fuels, we just stop where we are. Yeah, now. yeah, okay. yeah, exactly. And the electricity we use today in our demo plant is also green electricity, which is also certified, of course. In the future, it makes sense to use the electricity um, from uh, abundant places where we cannot use the, 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 the electricity, for example, from the desert to transport it where we need the electricity. Okay. So we can use that electricity from the desert. We uh, store it into a liquid like fuel, so part liquid and we supply the fuel everywhere in the world. So we are able to use more green electricity as we do today. Okay, so and just to clarify, green electricity is basically like wind generation or solar. So correct me if I'm wrong, so that means like, let's say you go and build a huge solar field in the Sahara Desert, yeah. you're saying you want to build a fuel lab next to it? Yeah. So then you, because it's impossible, it's very hard to transport the electricity from Sahara Desert to North America, but you can turn it into the fuel and then just ship the fuel. Exactly. In a big ship powered by synthetic fuel. Exactly. I mean, <laughs> come on! <laughs> okay, so what are, what are the sort of struggles? Why, why isn't this everywhere? Why aren't we just literally filling up our cars at the pump with this right now? What are the... Well, the struggle is, of course, um, I don't want to blame them, but it's politicians because we had this green electricity agenda for quite a while 
And I have to be honest, of course, we see uh, the, the electrical vehicles as a necessary part of the future. Sure. But due to the fact that we have 1.6 billion of internal combustion engine still out there today, we need to find other uh, technologies and solutions to, uh, to decarbonizing the, the, the mobility. So the struggle is to convince more and more people to use this type of fuels, to, to uh, um, yeah, put it in their cars so that we are able to scale up to increase the production, to decrease the price. And we are more than happy to have uh, supporters like you <laughs> to do so. So that's a great thing. But I, I'm, like, I'm just so enthusiastic about it because, yeah, I agree with everything you're saying and see this, especially within the enthusiast community, as, as a really fantastic route to keep a lot of the, the cars that we love on the road. D cost. So, you know, if I wanted to buy fuel off you today, yeah. how much is it like per litre? Is, is it more expensive? Is it... It is more expensive, like okay. we are now currently uh, for, for the pricing between 5 and 6 euros, okay. which is due to the fact that we only produce a fairly small volume. Sure. Of course, big enough to supply all the championships, but not big enough to supply all the petrol stations uh, out there. So the great thing is that, um, of course, this is not the price that we will uh, stick on for the future. We will decrease it if we scale up and produce more. Okay, and then myth busting, I suppose, or maybe just me being a bit nervous. Can anything go wrong with my car? Like, is like, is there any, does the fuel <laughs> corrode easier? Like, is there like what what's the, are the what are the issues? Potential issues? No, the great thing is that, as I said before, it is the EN two two eight normation, okay. so it is basically the same as a normal fuel. And I can mix it because I got like I got like one liter of fuel. <laughs> I, I got my car here. The light was flashing like this, but I can mix it with like normal exactly. fuels and. Okay. So this, this, for example, would be the aim um, in scale of uh, um, or, or in terms of scaling the fuel. Of course, we cannot replace all the fuel at the pump stations tomorrow, but at least we can add 15%, 50%, 75%, 200%. And we have the aim to change directly to the 100% because we have to make the changes fast for the, 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 the climate shift. Sure. So no, there can there is nothing that can go wrong. Uh, we did some tests, as you saw with Sebastian Vettel, with the 1922 Aston Martin. Oh, yeah, I didn't even mention that. I mentioned the Williams thing, but yeah, 1922 exactly. Aston Martin Exactly. Well. So he has a world record of the oldest car driving on synthetic fuels. Really? Okay, nice. We did uh, some weeks ago the Grand Premier de Nouvelaire with Ecury Bertelli with a 1936 Aston Martin, and the feedback was, was amazing. So it drove smoother than on the Italian fuel. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that gives me a bit more confidence, but no, I'm joking. I mean... I'm sure a lot of you are thinking the same, that it almost sounds too good to be true, but it's not really. It's just the fact, like you said, that there is a much bigger agenda globally to push the EV narrative. And I don't think either of us want to sit here and bash that entirely. And oh. maybe later in this video, I'll come on to, you know, the obvious benefits of, of some EV use. But yeah, as of today, why we're not all just making this shift immediately seems seems baffling. And when you see some of the cars uh, inside this place, uh, let alone my 360, there's a reason why we should be keeping some of our history, motoring yeah. history, on the road. So, mate, thank you so much. Thank you. We well, can sit here waffling all day. Maybe we'll do a podcast. <laughs> I think there's an hour-long chat in here somewhere, but let's, let, let's get back to the action and, I guess, put some fuel in my car. Go for it. Okay. <laughs> Now, just for any conspiracy theorists out there, I just wanted to show you that my tank is... Well, actually, it's not as empty as it was a second ago. Classic 360. When you drop to kind of two bars, it goes from two to empty real quick. But it is, it is super, super low. So, it is time for the refueling. Now, I don't trust myself, so I have a very glamorous assistant here <laughs> who's going to be doing the refueling process. Uh, this is our big old can that's been supplied by P1. I'm just transferring it into a jerry can because it'll be a little bit easier to put into the car. Weirdly or interestingly, the fuel, the synthetic fuel, smells a little bit different to normal fuel. It's not quite as sort of toxic really you you had your nose yeah. right in there a yeah, second ago yeah. and you weren't even choking were you yeah it's just a, diff a slightly different smell anyway so yeah this is the process just for for now we're not at a traditional fuel pump unfortunately but um that's okay we get hands on as i say the guys at historic competition services as you're going to see do this kind of thing fairly regularly so yeah i'll stand uh, i'll stand here <laughs> and applaud you i guess or we'll cheer you along and then the car will very shortly have a tank fuel full of synthetic fuel Okay, we are fully fueled up, or at least that can is now empty. So here is the big test. Ignition first, please. Where's my fuel? 
There you go, Nero's Dam at full. And let's try a start up. Oh no, <laughs> that was a panic. Maybe I should do the uh, immobiliser first. Okay, try again and start up. Smooth. Well, that's encouraging. That's very encouraging. We're gonna hit the road very shortly and enjoy this car with its new fuel. But first off, I wanna show you Historic Competition Services because this place is full of some absolutely outrageous pre-war metal. This very car is being um, delivered from new to a Scottish guy called Cormac and was raised in period by a guy called Robert Colley. And Robert Colley, um, well, used to drive it and race it around. Um, and during the war he was an RIF pilot. Um, and after the war he was famous again, he was in news again. But this time as Roberta Colley. No! Yes, uh, so it's the first transgender of England. No way! And even as a female afterwards, he also raced and he was quite successful as she, well. She, Or she, sorry, <laughs> she was very... Easy mistake to make. <laughs> yes, yes, so she was very um, successful as well afterwards. Wow, so that's wow, quite, uh, amazing! This is a very, very early um, Alfa Romeo RL. Uh, very rare to find, as it was a very early stage of Alfa Romeo. Um, and this one is originally sold in Argentina and was also raised in Argentina. Uh, but after the owner died, the family took it away behind the shed, literally, because the father thought it was too dangerous to race and to drive. This is a 1914 Lancia Kappa. Um, it, we got three engines to it. One came out of a uh, World War One armored vehicle. Okay. Uh, the other one came with the car. And the third engine that we got is actually the experimental engine. Uh, it's number 149 and we even got the certificates from the Lancia family and that one is built by Lancia and then put in the hospital as a power generator. No way. Um, can, we, can I come back at some point? Maybe we can take one of these things out? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, I would be very honoured to do okay, that. Okay, we're going to make a deal with that. Absolutely. For now I need to go make sure my 360 still works. So, <laughs> thank you for having me. Thank no, you for hosting no, me. And I'll, I'll see you soon. Very soon. Okay, thank Good. you. <laughs> I told you, it's a very cool place. Like I was just saying to Jonathan, I'm going to be back. I'm definitely going to be back to film some stuff there, but I'm so intrigued to get out in this car with its synthetic fuel in. So let's start up again. I don't know why like, I keep, I shouldn't be sort of making out like I'm nervous because I do have every confidence in this product, but it's just, well, it's different, isn't it? It's, it's unique. There we go, up and running. Uh, let's get the old sat nav on. We are heading to the Euro Tunnel. Uh, Euro Tunnel, there we go. Two and a half hours, 200 kilometers. I wonder what my fuel economy will be like with this synthetic fuel. I haven't really thought about that yet. Anyway, let's crack on, hit the road, get the fuel all mixed in, and then uh, I'll catch up with you on the motorway. I don't know what I'm expecting to happen, but I'm like waiting for something to happen. I'm like, it's gonna feel different, it's gonna sound different or smell different, but it's all just normal, which is exactly what Benjamin said it would be. He explained that the fuel we've just put in is basically the same as the fuel you get at a standard petrol station, it's just made differently. So the car shouldn't behave or perform any differently, exactly the same, which is what it's doing. I was wondering if I was gonna get any better fuel economy. I haven't quite gone far enough yet to work that out, but there's no reason why I should get better fuel economy. It should all just be the same. And you know, with their motorsport department, the P1 Racing Fuels, you know, they're, de they're developing really high octane stuff for maximum performance. So I guess that's to come, or maybe it would have been available today. I could have asked for some 100 octane, but no, we basically put, yeah, just standard fuel in and everything seems great. I'm now just guilt free rather than adding carbon to the atmosphere and increasing our emissions i'm just recycling it guilt free motoring and should ensure i can continue to enjoy this car well into the future I mean, it's brilliant right the reason i wanted to do the whole refueling segment at historic competition services i think it's important that us enthusiasts get behind this or get behind synthetic fuels we're the ones that talk about cars all the time we're the ones that our family and friends ask for advice on cars. Come on, how many times has your mum called you up or your mate said, 
Oh, I'm thinking of get, getting a new car. What do you think I should get? We're the ones in the know. And we should be the ones, if we believe in synthetic fuels, saying, don't get an EV, just, just hold tight. Synthetic fuel's coming. Hold on to your five-year-old Range Rover Evoque or Ford Fiesta. You don't need to chop it in just yet. Because not only will that help to ensure that we can continue to enjoy cars like this, but that our automotive history, which is part of modern human history, lives on. Like we just saw in that workshop, cars have played such a huge role in society and humanity. That Lancia engine once powered a hospital. I mean, combustion engines and combustion engine cars have done amazing things or been part of amazing stories. Just to get rid of them, because we can't think of a greener way to fuel them, kind of makes no sense. Especially when the kind of pushed alternative actually initially emits more carbon production of electric vehicles, like I mentioned, is carbon intensive. And to power them, to generate the electricity, it's not particularly green. I mean, recent UK stats suggest that up to 65% of our electricity is still made via gas. That's not green. And look, you know, synthetic fuels at the moment, they're not perfect. There are things that need to be ironed out. They do still rely on green electricity, or at least P1 performance fuels do. But as Benjamin mentioned, you know, you could go and build uh, a solar power station or farm or I don't know what in the Saharan desert. And rather than having to figure out how to then transport that electricity to countries like the UK to charge electric vehicles, I don't even know how you do that. You can just build a synthetic fuel lab next to it, make the synthetic fuel and then transport that anywhere around the world with other synthetically fuel powered vehicles. And we haven't even touched on planes and boats, things like that. Can you imagine trying to build an electric plane? This is not happening. But I wouldn't even know, just like with the 360, if I was on a plane that had synthetic fuel, I'd have no idea because everything's just the same. I just wanted to do this because it's something I'm really passionate about. And there are other companies creating synthetic fuels. P1 is not the only people out there, but given their ties to motorsport, with Sebastian Vettel, I had the confidence to immediately jump into bed with them and to put their fuels in this car and demonstrate that it's kind of ready. It just needs the same push that electric is getting around the world. If we had a few more politicians and, and governments saying, we're gonna promote and fund and aid the development of synthetic fuel, that's what we wanna push forward with, it would, oh my God, the speed of development would be insane. And then you've got a quick fire way to limit carbon emissions from cars. And then you can still look at developing small electric vehicles for wealthy city centers because it's expensive and it's not that green. So look, I'm not saying this is it, this is the only one. There's also hydrogen and there's various other things that we can look at. But for the right now, the short term and the enthusiast market, I think synthetic fuels needs to be a thing. So if you're interested, if you found this interesting, go and do your own research. As I say, there are other companies out there. Go and read up. I'm not a scientist. I'm not a journalist. I'm just someone who's passionate about cars and trying to keep them on the road into the future. And I've tried to learn as much as possible, but there's definitely more that you can learn. And then if you are enthusiastic like I am about it, spread the word. Go and tell me, because the more we're talking about it, the more it will come onto the public agenda and then the political agenda yeah anyway so far as i say so good i've got another hour and a half to the euro tunnel to wrap up all the adventures with this car this year